In any redox reaction, we have a transfer of electrons from one element or compound to another. So let's take the reaction between permanganate and iron 2. In the case of permanganate to iron 2, in an acidic solution, there's a transfer of five electrons. And the actual balanced chemical reaction looks like this. If we wanted to harness that these transfer of electrons, we could use them to perform mechanical work. So the basis for electricity, since electricity is the transfer of electrons or the flow of electrons, if we can harness this, this would give us uh, something that we could use to do work. However, if we just put these two solutions together, we can't actually trap those electrons because there's they aren't they would be free to f flow from one to the other as soon as they collided. So if we separated these two solutions, where we put the um, reduction reaction on one in one beaker, and we put the oxidation reduction, the oxidation re reaction in another, we have something that looks like this. However, this is not going to do anything because here we have an inert electrode, something that's not going to react with them in there, but there, these electrons can't just flow through the air to each other. So we have to connect them with a conductive wire. And now the electrons are free, are free to flow from here, or sorry, from here to there. There's a flow of electrons as this iron is oxidized and this permanganate is reduced. But as these electrons flow from one side to the other, there would be a, a gradual buildup of a, of a negative charge in this side as electrons are flowing to the, to the over here, and there would be a gradual build of, pos of positive charge on this side. So then eventually, the electrons are going to stop flowing because they're going to try to balance out to make this a neutral compound. As soon as those electrons started, they would more or less stop because there would be no push to get to the other side. So we need to balance out the charges somehow. And we accomplish this by using something that won't react with either react won't, re won't react with this reaction, but it will allow the elect the electrical charges to balance out. And the device we use is what we, is what's called a salt bridge. The salt bridge is typically filled with some sort of auger or porous material that allows the ions that are trapped within it to flow from one solution to another. It's typically a U-shaped glass piece of glassware, but it can also be a porous opening, like this one. So if we were to use a salt bridge uh, here, we would have an auger filled with, say, potassium nitrate, because that won't form any precipitate out of this reaction and won't react with them. If we were to use a porous disk as our salt bridge, it would simply allow the electron, the, the, it would simply allow the ions to flow from one side to another. Either one of these setups is what we call a galvanic cell or voltic cell, which is simply a spontaneous redox reaction in which the electrons are harnessed in order to perform mechanical work. Those electrons flow from the anode, where oxidation takes place, to the cathode, where reduction takes place. So in an example of iron 2 and permanganate, iron 2, the iron 2 half cell, because that's what half of a cell is, where, where oxidation takes place, is our anode, and those electrons are going to flow from that anode to the cathode, where the permagnumate half cell is, which is our cathode. If we attach a voltmeter to our galvanic cell, it will tell us the amount of energy passing through, or the amount, or the number of joules per coulomb passing through that wire, allowing us to assign it a voltage. So let's look at another example. A zinc 
Zinc, oxi zinc and copper. The redox reaction between zinc and copper. Once the electrons start flowing, as zinc is oxidized, as it gives up those electrons to the copper, it begins to fall apart, or at least it looks like it is, because it's actually losing mass. It's, become, it's going into solution. On the opposite side, copper is gaining mass, so the cathode gains mass while the anode loses it. At the atomic level, the zinc is giving up those electrons and going into solution. And the copper is gaining those electrons and coming out of solution. The ions in the salt bridge actually flow into either half cell, where if you're dealing with the Anno side of the reaction, the an the anions flow to the ano to the anion to the anode, sorry, and the cations flow to the cathode. Let's use this example to expand on this a little bit. You can write this reaction out quickly in what's called law or what's called. I get this to work. Standard cell notation or line notation. The way that you can do this is that you, it's called an ion sandwich. And it looks very similar to a net ionic equation, but it includes a, it includes a discussion on the concentration. So let's say that this solution over here is one molar. And same on this side, that you have one molar zinc nitrate and one molar uh, copper nitrate. The standard cell notation for this would be zinc, zinc 2, copper 2, copper. So it would look like this. On the, ano si on the anode side you have zinc becoming zinc 2. On the copper side, on the cathode side, you have copper two becoming copper. Mush that two together by separating it by a salt bridge. So we'll double line that because that's not taking part in the reaction, and you'll have the standard cell notation. Ta-da! And see, it's an ion sandwich where the ions are in between the solids or the the, um, yeah, solids. As I said before, the flow of electrons from the zinc or from the anode to the copper or the cathode is spontaneous. And what causes it to be spontaneous is because there's a difference in the potential energy of each of those metals. And this causes those electrons to be pushed, more or less. And the difference in this potential energy is measured in volts. And again, a volt is one joule per coulomb. The force provided by this difference is what we call electromotive force, or EMF. And it's the force that drives those electrons through that external circuit for us to harness. EMF, or cell potential, can be broken into the anode side and the cathode side. And is measured against a standard, which is the standard hydrogen electrode, or SHE. Now all of the values of the potential reductions that can happen in, a, in typical galvanic cells are given to you on your AP givens or on your table, the one that looks like this. It says standard reduction potentials in aqueous solution at 25 degrees Celsius. Now that at 25 degrees Celsius, that's the standard condition. And it's one of three. So 25 degrees Celsius is what we're going to consider for right now. Also, all the solutions we're going to deal with are going to be one mole. And 
and our pressure is going to be one atmosphere. As long as you have these three conditions, you can use this table exactly as it is. And when you have these standard conditions, we symbolize this with E naught. Yes, that that degree sign is not, not prime. Sorry, guess I need to pay more attention before I lectured you guys on it on Friday. But regardless, this table has the standard cell potentials, uh, or the standard half cell potentials, for any reaction you could use in uh, a voltic cell. And if you look, the she is right down here, the standard hydrogen electrode, hydrogen becoming hydrogen elemental, hydrogen gas, that is our standard by which we measure everything against. That's why it's given the value of zero. So let's look back at our galvanic cell between zinc and copper. First off, zinc is being oxidized, so that makes it the and our copper is being reduced, so that makes it the cathode. And notice how our concentration is one molar for both of these. If, say, this was happening at one atmosphere and 25 degrees Celsius, we could look at each of these reactions and determine the cell potential, or the E naught, of each one. So let's look at our table for zinc being oxidized into zinc 2 plus. So we pull up our table, we look around for zinc, ah, there it is, zinc, oh no, this is backwards, right, we're going from zinc to zinc 2 plus, so actually since zinc is being oxidized, we're going to take the opposite of this number, so it's not negative 0 0.76, it would be a positive 0 0.76. So on this side we have the cell potential is 0 0.76 and over here we're going from copper 2 plus to copper so we look for that. Pull up my table. Alright here we go copper 2 plus to copper we got positive 3.4 or 0 0.34 so the cell potential of the reduction reaction is 0 0.34. If we add these two together, we'll have the cell potential, or the EMF, for this overall reaction. So 0 0.34 plus uh, 7.6. Again, the cell potential would be 1.1 volts for this overall um, galvanic cell. And when we plug a voltmeter in, we, it's what we would expect to see. And sure enough, that's what we've got. Lastly, notice how zinc is down here on this table. Meanwhile, copper is up here. The higher up metals or nonmetals since this is a reduction table, the more something is willing to be reduced, the more positive its value is going to be. And the, therefore, mostly non-metals would be at the top. At the bottom, the more something is willing to be oxidized give, uh, to uh, uh, develop positive charges, so therefore metals, the more likely it is to be at the bottom, and therefore would have a more negative value. So things at the top are typically your cathode, and things at the bottom are typically your anode. Reduction potentials are an intensive physical property, and therefore they are not subject to how many stoke, how much, like, what the coefficient is, is of the balanced chemical reaction. So it doesn't matter if it takes one zinc to one copper or a hundred zinc to one copper. It's the same intensive physical property, the cell potential. And that is basics for electrochemistry.